I mean, modernity is the myth of wholeness. It's the cult of innocence and purity. Um, it's basically caught up in the idea that you are whole on your own. You're perfect. You're adequate. You're not indebted to anyone, you know. But in a paradigm of becoming, of ontogenesis, of a differential or difference ontology, um, there, wholeness is is also a becoming, <laughs> which is paradoxical. So that wholeness is only shows up in part. Um, this seems like a good time to invoke the name of the goddess, the Indian goddess Akilandeshvari, whose story I cannot quite recall at this time of the night. Um, but um, I know her name means um, one who is never not broken, never not broken. And I think that speaks to what we are, not to emerge, to constantly become other than what we are, you know, not to be final and stuck and caught up somewhere, is to only show up in traces. I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today our guest is Bayo Akamalafe. Bio is an author, speaker, lecturer, renegade academic, ethno-psychotherapeutic researcher, and proud diaper changer. Bio is globally recognized for his poetic, unconventional, and counterintuitive take on global crisis, civic action, and social change. He is executive director and chief curator for the Emergence Network. Bio has been a visiting professor at Middlebury College and has taught in universities around the world. He speaks and teaches about his experiences globally and then returns to his adopted home in Chennai, India. He considers his most sacred work to be learning how to be with his daughter and son and their mother, his wife and life nectar. You've given me permission to speak in a way that doesn't really matter if people fully grasp it. It's more like the truth of our own thread of expression. And so anyways, I've been feeling this joy and excitement slash nervousness to connect with you coming from that uh, great gratitude for how you are in the world. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. I'd love to talk about home and your Nigerian roots. And this place that you're in now, maybe home in its fullest sense now, whatever that is to you. I think the first thing to say here is how grateful I am to be on this call with you too, sister, and, and, to, meet, uh, and to meet you and to talk while talking is still permitted and it's not um, a criminal act. Uh, we never know the gifts we have. Um, until we find out that um, the ordinary things become luxurious and, and touch becomes pathological <laughs> as it is now with the pandemic striking. Um, so I'm grateful to be here speaking with you and for the privilege of this conversation. And maybe that is a beautiful way to segue or to actually dive into this notion of home. I come from a, a country, the blackest nation on earth, um, the biggest conglomeration, the largest conglomeration of black bodies on the planet called Nigeria. And um, I come from the Yoruba people, but I was born in exile. I was born in, I was born out of my mother's womb, if you will. Um, that, the, that the scenario, the, the architecture, the world that I was born in was, uh, was, not the, was not the world that my great, great grandfathers knew. I'm, I'm not hoping that, um, I'm not insinuating or suggesting that 
um, the world is static enough for us to be, for our own children to be born in the same worlds that we're born in. But it was a radically different world. It was the, it was the one touched by colonial interruptions. Um, the one that was subverted, unsettled, disturbed by a very pervasive sense of distance that to be full, to be whole, is to travel, is to leave. <laughs> to be at home is to leave. To really arrive, you know, we have a saying in Lagos where we point to someone who drives into the neighborhood with a Mercedes Benz or flashes a gold watch or something like that, that he's arrived, you know, that, that guy has arrived. The, the, the sense is that, you know, you're, you're home now because you've been overseas. You've, you've been there. I've been there, done that, and I'm home to throw money around. So there was, there was, there was this sense of dissatisfaction with place that is not disconnected from the processes that were left um, in the wake of British colonization. Um, so I grew up never learning my own language. I grew up never appreciating my own culture. It was just a distraction from the main thing of getting myself educated, um, taking lots of ice cream, um, learning more about Spider-Man, you know, my nerdish teenage days. Um, I, I didn't care a lot about my language. In fact, I tried my hardest not to speak it when people, um, my colleagues in secondary school or even in the university, spoke it out of a sense of um, revolutionary uh, insistence, like we're going to do it anyway. Because I grew up in, in a situation where teachers would beat students for speaking your own language. Vernacular is what they called it. Um, so um, home was home had always been a problematic thing for me. Um, added to that is the Christological notion of heaven being far away, you know, rapture being down the road, sticking to the straight and narrow. Um, and this was the world that I grew up in, in that, you know, don't forget everywhere around you, long for success, long for Jesus Christ, long for um, transcendence. Um, I'm now beginning to come down to earth. And it's a beautiful, not only in the sense of not being in an airport right now, as was originally planned in my itinerary for the year 2020, but in the sense of meeting the valuable, shockingly useful, um, and um, radically hospitable gifts and uh, places and sites of power that are encoded in Yoruba, Ifa religions and and cosmologies in, in, um, in particular readings of new materialisms and different kinds of feminist uh, insights read through Yoruba culture that basically speaks of a different world, uh, a world that, is not, that does not premise the sacred in the far away, but notices that here, where we are, is already sacred, that enchantment is not in short supply. And that we can, if we learn to, um, notice the colors around us, notice, notice the others in the room with us. Uh, so, yeah, that, that feels like a way of bringing in the notion of home here. I am learning to ground my feet and be at home. I was reading a little bit about your religious upbringing, like what you're sharing right now, kind of you're pulling little bits of it in and you say, God doesn't merely exist. God is a becoming, a possibility. Put differently, God is being worked out. She, he is coming down to earth in the face of Athorian riddles, trying to figure out things with and for us. This is the fugitive God that is not in his proper place, the homeless God, the not knowing God, the splintered divine. So as you're just sharing right now about home, um, I've never heard God described in this way. And it doesn't even actually allow me to place anything solid in that expression. <laughs> it's 
so it, it feels like it is. That's why I was like, there's no way I can give a synopsis of this. So what is, can you share <laughs> more about this? Because it feels so rooted to this place you're speaking of, of your upbringing and uh -huh. coming to earth now. And then yeah. that experience of this new form of the sacred and God. Yeah. Uh, I, as an undergrad in my first year, I wrote an essay that was considered really controversial in a Christian university. I wrote an essay called God is a Goat. And and <laughs> it wasn't taken well at all. And my notion was, you know, I wanted to prove, the, I wasn't as about to establish that God is an actual literal goat, but I wanted to um, disturb and it play with shock value here and, and to invite people to actually consider their notions of God and how we actually think about God, especially down there, you know, in Nigeria. Um, if a black man were to walk into a church, with a flowing beard. I think people would think he, that this guy is a madman and chase him out very quickly. But if a white man, a Gandalfian figure, were to walk into that same church, everyone would be like, probably that's an angel. You're like, this um, unnoticed uh, construction of God as a, as a white male, you know, with flowing beard, um, it was what I grew up with. It was the notion of God that I grew up with. And it was so pervasive, so invisible to touch, so resistant, you know, to uh, modification that it takes a lot of, I don't know, it takes a gift to be able to come to see that. And as I began to see that and play with these ideas, um, and as I began to fall down to earth, you know, in humiliation, which I think is a gift as well, and confusion. Um, the notion of God started to change. Um, I started to think of God not as a transcendent quality, not absolutely anyway, but as a, uh, an imminent force. Um, because my notion of matter started to change as well. Matter was, wasn't just the, uh, uh, a container for human meanings, the meanings we impose on the world. It became mattering. You know, it put, to put a gerund to the word matter, it became mattering. That, that means you can't trap it. You can't say matter is, you know, already it flows away from the isness of your description. Um, so it's a mattering, as Karen Barad, one of my um, dear friends and co uh, colleagues, a colleague would say. Um, so matter became this enchanted thing. It became... Um, full of vitality, agential, intelligent, instead of dormant, dead, a natural resource I can put in a family way or tame for my own needs, you know, of our social needs or collective needs. And with that came the crashing of God, like God literally falling down to earth and, and crashing into the creation that he supposedly, um, you know, invented in a whim in a moment of a whimsical, you know, a desire for self-expression. Um, and with that, I'm learning to see God around me. I think theologians would call it pantheism or panentheism, not pantheism. Pantheism is the notion that God is the world um, and the world is God. And panentheism is something slightly different that I think I feel drawn to is the idea that God is not God and the world are entangled. Um, but maybe God is slightly more. Maybe God is the instigation, the constant instigation, the constant invitation for the world not to congeal too easily to a fixed and absolute value. Maybe God is emergence. You know, the incorporeal is what Elizabeth Grosje would call that uh, understanding. God is the constant invitation to the world to fall apart again and again. And so God doesn't become some exterior force that is waiting to um, hold a magnifying glass uh, against the sunlight and burn little ants that don't abide by his grand will. God becomes this, God becomes the yawning of a plant, you know, the ruptured places in a landscape. It becomes the, uh, the stretching 
of a tree. It becomes every moment. It becomes this feminine desire to touch oneself and have orgasmic reactions and surprising reactions to the idea that I am more than um, the stabilized, static thing that modernity pretends me to be. Um, and so um, this idea of a panentheistic God, of an apophatic God, unspeakable, um, uh, beyond words, but also uh, deeply connected with everything around us, um, inter intercarnated is what uh, uh, Catherine Keller would call this idea, intercarnated, into, born in everything, is, is beautiful to me. And, and that's how I like to speak about it, yeah. So where do you think, as you share this, I mean, what is the, um, what is the resistance for us to have that as a possible daily experience of God? The, what is it that, mm. wants, that, that really wants us to have the separate experience of this God out there and then, you know, that, that offers consistency? Because what I'm hearing is, like, I feel like there's this underlying thread of exhaustion in the world. Uh -huh. And when I hear you speak, I feel like life enters in that rupture and that bewilderment. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's like we're just deadening ourselves, right, as a culture. I mean, I, not all of us and not all the time. And obviously, we're all in moments not in that place. But it feels mm -hmm. like as a whole, we keep wanting to solidify this, this God and, and, and make it something that seems to, to drain us. And uh, mm -hmm separate us from the life force uh, that we're constantly mm -hmm. coming together and falling apart. So yeah, what are, what are your thoughts on, on why we have this particular affinity towards uh, mm -hmm. this, this, this particular kind of God? And I think the, uh, go ahead, sister, go ahead. Oh, I didn't and not it. the other, you know, not what you're sharing in terms of this splintered becoming. Divine and becoming. Yes. Um, I feel that, um, Maybe I should start from James Hillman um, and the idea that the world around us is full and teeming with gods in play. That is, uh, and I do not mean, you know, we, we tend to take the world literally or in some literalist um, from an em of hard and fast empirical uh, perspective. Um, dreams are not real myth, they're not real, um, gods are not real, um, spirits are not real. It's only the thing that is supposedly, that supposedly coheres with this Aristotelian notion of the five senses that is seen as real. And I feel that is an impoverished notion of the real, that the real is also the things that may not even, that may be virtual and incorporeal and and not tactile, um, that, that as long as it has an effect, it's real. Um, so when my daughter comes to me and says, for instance, that Dada, are unicorns real? I say, if you can imagine it, it's real. And I, and I, I, I always um, make, exercise some caution and carefulness there, um, not to teach my daughter that, um, imagination is central to the world or human imagination is central to the world. Another anthropocentric gesture that if she can think about it, then it will pop out in the world. That's not what I mean to say to her. Or, but what I do invite her to notice is that the real is more vibrant and rich and flamboyant than our measuring devices can notice. Um, now, having said that, I, I feel that, um, as James Hillman also noticed, that the mind is not in the psyche, or the psyche is not in the mind, the mind is in the psyche, that we are part of assemblages, networks of bodies meeting and inter interacting with each other. And in these fields of becoming, the human is not paramount. We're in a parliament of other voices. So how we believe how we see, how we imagine, how we want, what we long for, what hope means. These discourses are shaped, manufactured. They emerge in these productive, um, generative fields of becoming. So it's not the human that is in charge. I, I'm not in charge. 
you're not in charge. Decolonization is, is not our work. You know, it becomes the work of the whole, which transcends identity. Um, I think, uh, to give a baseline, lest I trips off into my um, murmurings, um, I feel that new gods are beckoning, that new stories are inviting us into their fields, especially in these times of crisis, um, that the, the gods of st stability, and I cannot speak to how we got here, you know, how we have proliferated gods of civilization, the gods of sedentary living and stability, the gods that are made in our own image. Um, the time needed that probably. Maybe the world needed that in that moment, um, in a sense, um, and it became the dominant force. Um, right now, I feel um, there, there are breaches in the, in the temples of those, of, of those gods, and new kinds of worshipping are being invited, um, and tricksters are leading the way, because tricksters are the porous places in, in acts of worship. They're basically dancing at the edges of our fences and saying, come hither, you know, come here um, and, and play here. Maybe you can play with Pan. Maybe, maybe you can play with Eshu. Maybe you can play with Bacchus. Maybe there are other ways of thinking about the world and purging yourself, your, uh, yourself of your sense of mastery um, that you can do over here. Uh, and maybe you need that now, especially when the whole world is going upside down. Maybe you need to kill those gods <laughs> or compost them at least so that they can become something different. Because if they're becoming, maybe your worship is incarcerating them. Maybe you're imprisoning those gods and not letting them go on their way. You know, um, maybe it's a mutual kind of incarceration. Um, and so I, I write a lot about tricksters. I write a lot about um, new places of worship, grief as a form of worship. Um, not necessarily the act of crying, but noticing loss as a cartographical project of re-evaluating our positionality in the world. And this touches on race and economy and education and lots of things. But yes, my sister, I think we need new gods. Uh, and the new gods might be ancient gods or ones we haven't heard of before. But definitely we need, we need new gods. Grief seems so the natural ally of this aliveness that we want. And I've heard you share some stories about um, when your father passed away, when you were young, when you were maybe 15, yep. I think it was. Yeah, um, 15. And your experience of that and also your experiences with grief in more clinical settings and kind of this experience of empathy. And I'd love to talk about that because even just reading about your experience with your father really broke open the possibility in my heart and my being around that uh, the ways that we kind of, um, I mean, it's, it's common knowledge that we, we, we hope we never have to deal with grief in our culture, in Western culture. We hope we will never have to deal with it. And if we deal with it, we hope we can just do it very quickly alone, just get through it. And yeah. I really appreciate the way you've shared about grief and the pace of grief and the collective aspect of grief and kind of the ways that we do empathy that might not benefit us uh, in you know general Western culture. So, I mean, anything you would love to sh you'd like to share about grief, I, I would be interested in hearing. I mean, there is there is a sense in which grief is more than human. Um, Again, it's this thing that I notice, of course, it's not singularly my noticing, um, but the idea that feelings are felt here, you know, within, it's the great inside of human subjectivity that almost disallows us from noticing that the world is also in performance and that affect and emotions are streaming in the air so to speak. And one can only speak about these realities with poetic voice, I think. Um, that the world transcends or emotions transcend the human figure um, in, in, a, in a way. I mean, there, there is um, some research 
I haven't read the bulk of it or gone through it entirely, but I'd suggest that bacteria living in our guts, these microbial life forms, are traffickers, you know, of um, trauma, intergenerational trauma. They, they're, they're conducting some criminal fugitive work <laughs> in our bellies, taking encoding memories. And, and then we tell ourselves it's my feeling, which is such a reduction of the things that are happening at large. So I think grief, uh, grieving and, or grief, I prefer to use the word grieving to suggest that it's a flowing, it's not a static thing. I feel grieving is, has this effect of, of pulling us down to the, to the, to the earth, to, to, to dark places, um, of purging our bodies of its sense of confidence, you know, in a regime of light that is stabilizing, that is reassuring, um, that is colonial often. Um, so grief pulls us down and makes us curl into ourselves. And I think things that curl, I, I, I dare say, at least with prophetic voice, that things that curl up in themselves, when a flower waltz to the ground, it's probably a form of grief. That things are grieving around us um, all the time. Um, the world is in performance of grief. Um, mod modernity comes in as, in my mind, as the repudiation of the agency of grief. Um, if you can think of this dualism between the city and the wilds, the monster and the human, uh, the fairies and the orcs, using uh, uh, story elements in the Lord of the Rings. If you can think about it that way, then you would, it might be easier to picture that grief feels like a flood that, you know, just washes in. Uh, to resist that, to protect ourselves from the effects of grieving, we mount up conceptual structures. Um, we mount up the notions of the self. We mount up the idea of the individual and the individual's sacred privacy. You know, we mount up the, the notion of productivity in the Calvinian sense of getting back to work, put yourself together. And as a recovering psychologist myself, I know deeply what that means, you know, to fix people and put them back into the stream of becoming or stream of productivity. And so I think the city is this large accidental arch architecture that is designed to ward off the effects of grief. We, we do need some self-definition. In order to emerge, we need boundaries. We cannot be simply washed over grief all the time. Um, but I think we've become so caught up and stuck in our, in our performance of defense, uh, in mounting these ramparts against the invading hordes of grief that, um, uh, yeah, we've lost the art of shape-shifting. Mm. Um, and, and so we're stuck. And, and it's this stuckness that we need to deal with. And so the idea then is, what does grief offer us now? Um, a sense of loss, a sense of um, otherness, uh, a sense of duplicity. And I mean duplicity in the duplicitous sense of being beside oneself, of stepping aside, if you will, and noticing that the self is a very limited construct, that when we grieve, uh, we, we, we kind of call in other things to be in community with us. In Africa, or at least Africa is huge, in Nigeria, and in a part of Nigeria, because Nigeria is huge, um, there are some, no one cries alone, you know, at least when my father died, people came together, people that I didn't even know, you know, and I've written about this, and it was nauseating to me as a city boy to see people crying more than I was, rolling on the ground and tearing their clothes for my father, and my father didn't know them, and they probably didn't know my father that well, um, until I started to learn about the how grief is not private, it's public. Uh, the darkness is shared. And in the sharing of it, 
we meet ourselves again and again, as if for the first time. Um, I did get to hear that those people were paid. Some of these people that come to your party or to your burial ceremony and cry, um, they are often paid. Um, but that's not, that doesn't reduce the value of what they're doing. Um, it actually increases it. It actually says this is needed. These people need to eat, but they're doing some kind of beautiful work here. And we need to support them in any way that the economy allows to do this work. Um, and sister, I feel that maybe we need this, this kind of noticing today, to notice that um, um, we're stuck. And one of the emancipatory portals that is opening in the fabric of our incarceration is this invitation to feel a sense of loss, at least to trace the traumatic dissociation that we all have suffered by being part of this modern process, this dissociation from the land, this notion that you and I are separate. And maybe with a sense of grief, with a sense of loss, we might gain a little. It can only be a partial restoration. There isn't there isn't a full wokeness, right? It's only partial. We show up in part. And I don't even think it's rest restoration is not the right word I want to use. Uh, a returning with a slash between re and turn, a coming back to the new, if you will. Um, and I think that's what grief does for us at this time. Will you say more about that partial bit? I mean, modernity is the myth of wholeness. It's the cult of innocence and purity. Um, it's basically, I think, uh, caught up in the idea that you are whole uh, on your own. You're perfect. You're adequate. You're not indebted to anyone. You know, uh, but in a paradigm of becoming, of ontogenesis, of a differential or difference ontology. Um, their wholeness is, is also a becoming, <laughs> which is paradoxical. So that wholeness is, only shows up in part. Um, this seems like a good time to invoke the name of the goddess, the Indian goddess Akilandeshvari, whose story I cannot quite recall at this time of the night. Um, but um, I know her name means... Um, one who is never not broken, never not broken. And I think that speaks to what we are, that to emerge, to constantly become other than what we are, you know, not to be final and stuck and caught up somewhere, is to, be, is to only show up in traces, to use the Derridan word. We only show up in traces. A comet that zooms past the sky is only is a fugitive you know across the cosmos but it can only be glimpsed in that trace um the trace that is a haunting you know is a sign is an absent present uh, presence or a present absence um, let me bring it down to earth in a little bit and say olivia is not fully here that what you are is still yet to come that you're, you're constantly becoming. And in a very real biological sense as well, right there sitting, talking with me, both of us are shedding cells. <laughs> We're constantly letting go of a part of ourselves. We're constantly dying. Um, to what extent would, how many cells would need to go before our sense of self dies? You know? uh, or where, does, where, does, where do I stop and where does the ground begin? You know, it, it feels like we're constantly interacting with the world around us. So that's what I mean by we only show up in part. And, and that informs my politics or the politics that I feel I'm crafting with others around me, weird politics. Uh, maybe our insistence on full righteousness, on, you know, you, we, uh, it's, people use the language of waking up. I think it's good, it's useful, but it sometimes suggests that you're either in or you're out. You're either good or you're bad. You're either racist or you're anti-racist. It doesn't allow for the understanding or the appreciation that we are framed and instigated and conditioned by agonistic forces that are not masterable, that are beyond 
our ability to control. So, so that is what I mean by we show up in part. It means maybe we should purge our expectations of this idea of full arrival. Maybe we can only embrace approach and that's all there is. I feel so much relief as you share and I want to contain this forever and not let it be. Like, I, you know, it's, <laughs> I'm noticing the, that experience of wanting to not let that rupture and not letting that uh, process, you know, the, the grieving, the ing, the moving, the, the um, flow of life. Yeah. I, I, I feel so good hearing what you're saying, which is, I'm just viscerally experiencing the human conundrum in this very moment is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Of, you know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, so, so wonderful. And then, like, how can this remain this a sense of emergence? And curious, uh, as you're speaking just about your politics, and so how does it feel for you in your mind and in your actual active life to engage in the world from this place of emergence? And what does that look like for you? You know, there's so much that the world needs, right? There's so much, there's so much suffering and um, great need for us to engage. And I think sometimes there can be talk of the extreme of, you know, either you're out there protesting or you're doing something, you're praying. And there's, and how, what is that place that you exist in? What's the territory? Um, I think... It's a post-activist space. Let me, let me ground that a little. I coined the term post-activism um, at a time when I wanted to signal that maybe there is a space for us to touch the materiality of responsibility, of responsivity. Um, and, and by that, I mean that sometimes the, we get st stuck in cyclical toxicity and we keep on doing things that we feel should be emancipatory, should be freeing. Um, but they actually circle back because again, like I said earlier, um, the world isn't indebted to our sense of justice. <laughs> it, it's, not, it, it, it's not driven or engineered or moved by our sense of what should be the right thing. See, you see? So, um, my politics, if I could call it that, has been this notion of post-activism, to notice that we will sometimes, in the name of defeating some enemy, some monster, crisis event, we sometimes ironically become the monster, right? Um, like in trying to kill a virus, we ironically reinforce the same conditions that made the virus, that gave the virus its embodiment, mm -hmm. that made zoonotic transfer uh, possible. And so this sense of irony is, is, is what, what post-activism is about. It's not about a deeper sense of activism or more spiritual sense of activism. Um, a way to chant in the morning or mindful meditation or anything like that. It's not, it's, not a, it's not an escape from the trouble, from sitting with the trouble. It's actually a broadening of accountability to include um, the fact that there are others in action with us. And we're not in the center of the room. We're not all that. All eyes are not on us. You know, wills are just as much in an economy of activisms of their own, um, as plankton and and lichens and um, and dogs and tables and software, that we are in this parliament of acting together. And we always act with, never acting alone. Um, so this notion of post-activism informed my um, invitation, uh, founding of the organization that we call the Emerges Network. And it's there that I'm doing a lot of theory that I feel is valuable at this time, doing a lot of invitation and calling um, people to a different sense of 
uh, of working with the planet, working with the world. This different sense is not a dismissal of identity politics. It's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not some kind of progress narrative that what you guys have been doing is dinosaur politics. We are the new guys in town. It's actually a honoring of that critique, the critique-based feminisms that have brought us here. But it's also a noticing of the limitations of that and saying that may not lead us to transformational moments because we're stuck in this analysis of what's wrong instead of embarking on exodus, exiles, you know, uh, fugitive departures away from this cartographical project that is human. Um, what does it look like every day for me? The most vital thing for me, apart from this work of writing and speaking, is being with my family. Um, we have a practice that is central. It is exhausting. I do not want to romanticize it. If my wife knows I'm romanticizing it, she would slap me upside the head. No, she wouldn't, but she would, she would be pretty pissed. Um, of unschooling our children, we call it unschooling. We didn't call it unschooling, but it's, uh, people call it unschooling. And the, the invitation here is to stay with our kids as um, philosophers, you know, as, as respected philosophers in their own right. Um, that maybe the post-human is calling on the human to be composted. And in a sense, children are post-human figures because when they come into the world or when they come out of the world, um, adultism wants to put them in the family way quickly to tell them this is how to be human and this is how to be in the world. Put away childish things, get an education, get a job, live, die. That's all there is. But I feel that children um, disturb the algorithm of forward movement. They stray away from the narratives, the expectations we put on them. They disobey, they play, they paint the walls. And in those um, radical acts of disturbance, <laughs> you know, we meet ourselves as if for the first time. So that I feel that I, I deeply suspect, and I'm not alone in this suspecting, that if we if we stayed with our kids, and I'm, again, sister, I, I never speak in a sense of universalism. Like if everyone pulled their kids out of school, no, I, I don't uh, think of the real in that way as a final truth. But this is real for us, especially in India, where uh, people, teenagers commit suicide. It has, has the highest suicide rates among teenagers. The last time I checked, I think in 2018 or 2019. And that is problematic here because India is this nation state apparatus that is trying to um, approximate um, the superiority of the United States. It's trying to get up there. You know, It implicitly believes, believes that we must catch up you know, to the West. And that is really problematic. So we are staying with our kids. We are conducting research projects with them. We are asking questions, journaling, um, committing acts of, um, <laughs> of reality bursting experiments um, to see the world anew um, and to revisit our assumptions about what is true, what is valuable, what is possible. Um, so that, that, that for me is, is the deeply personal space that seems to be overwhelming and yet invitational and ever alive, always um, hospitable, always inviting us to keep being here. Uh, but my broader work is post-activism in terms of inviting a framing of new kinds of thinking about what we can do in a climate change inflected and pandemic inflected world. Mm. Can you share, is there anything, any particular reality bursting experiences you're having right now with your family? Well, um, Alicia has a, Alicia is my daughter, our daughter, um, seven years old. She has an experiment in the freezer right now. 
Um, mm -hmm. She mixed oil and paint and water together. And then she put her and put it in a bowl and another bowl with just water. And she's trying to compare the freeze times. <laughs> if this one freezes faster than the other. And the experiment is so, it, in my mind, so what's the use of this? What, why, why, what, what's the, what's the utility of measuring how fast this painted oily water, you know, freezes and, and how water freezes? What's the idea? But that's play for, for, for you. You know, it, it doesn't have to have some purpose. It doesn't have to be published in a reputable journal to be good, to be powerful, to be paradigm bursting. Um, and and we're learning, you know. Uh, I tell the story all the time. I think this is the uh, the powerful one. You know, uh, two stories there actually, of of uh, me following Alethea to. I don't know if you've read it in my book, but you've read it right. So I, I wanted to talk. About it. I laughed out loud. The the, the sandals. <laughs> oh my gosh! But tell us, tell us, because I'd love to hear it again from you. It, it's being in Virginia, Richmond, we're staying for a while. And then she, uh, Lethia says, let's go swim. And I can't swim. And then she, you know, that day I'd woken up saying basically that I would, I would do anything she says. So it's a yes, dangerous experiment, but I'm going with it. I would do everything she says to do. And she says, let's go swim. So I say, yes, okay, let's do that. Even though I don't know how to. But as we approach the swimming pool, she suddenly discovers the lake just up ahead and says, that's the swimming pool. I remember my promise not to say no. And so we march towards the, the lake. And um, there at the lake, we just stand you know, together. And she's not given any new instructions and things are really getting awkward. And I decide maybe this is a good moment to teach my daughter some Yoruba stories or tell her about her father, her grandfather, her grandfathers that she never met, stuff like that. And she just punctuates and interrupts all my intentions and says, shh, you know, like, nope, no, let's just stand still and be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Dada. And we stand there and we're quiet. And I have this very powerful experience of witnessing, witnessing everything in, in bold colors. You know, it's not a psychedelic trip. It's, it's nothing of the sort, but it's a very affirming notion that I feel, I feel, I don't feel seen. You know, you know how people say, I feel seen, I feel valued. It's a different feeling. It, it's a, do you think a, a baby in a mother's womb wants to feel seen? <laughs> you know, um, I, I guess the baby in the mother's womb just wants to be cradled just wants to be overwhelmed by the warmth of that darkness, the amniotic darkness. Um, and, and that's how I feel in that moment. I don't feel the need to be recognized, the standout in the swirl and the dancing of ducks quacking or wind blowing or ants scurrying through the grass. I don't feel that need. I just feel warm. Like I actually see all of you and I feel embraced by this idea that I could never uh, embrace you totally. You know, a world that I can wrap my hands around is not a world that I want to live in, but a world that I am embraced in and that needs all our hands to embrace each other is the world that I feel is rich and vibrant and exciting and emergent. And so that's how I feel in that moment. And, um, and yeah, she, she takes it to extremes and says, paint your face with mud. And I say, that's it. Let's go. I'm done with the experiment. And then we go back. And, and, and you know, the, I tell that story because, you know, if we follow our kids, it takes us to surprising places. You might expect and plan for a swimming pool. And they just go to a lake. They just want a lake in that moment. And it may not be in the blueprint, but maybe the blueprint has its own limiting factors. And uh, children, if we stayed with them and allowed them to influence us, you know, to, to shake us, then maybe other realities, wiser worlds are possible. 
My favorite part of that story that you didn't mention was where you switched. Yes, I didn't mention that. <laughs> I didn't I mention that. I laughed so hard reading that. <laughs> Just imagining you putting up your little pink shoes on your. It shoes. was very. It was very embarrassing. <laughs> and and here's this black guy wandering in an explicitly white neighborhood. I was becoming really scared that I would have the cops called on me or something because I squeezed my feet and joggers were jogging nearby and basically looking at me with some kind of suspicion that I found myself actually explaining the situation to them as they jogged past that we're just playing. We're just, (laughs) yes, I want to do that again. What a schism, like the feeling of, you know, maybe the cops calling you and yet this like super tender yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, well, it, it's something. I'm glad I went through with it, at least to the extent of, at least to the extent of abiding by her toddling, toddler uh, spirituality. That's mm-hmm. a good term, toddler spirituality. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I worshipped a different god that day. Mm-hmm. It brings me kind of in this junction. I actually want to talk about your writing for a moment, but I also want to talk about your relationship with your wife. So let's actually go to your wife first and stay in the realm of sacred okay. work. Um, okay. I've been really inspired by the way you share about her, your devotion and your awe, and I'm interested to know what your evolution of devotion has been. If you're willing to share relationally with her, I think. Um, and just what that tending is, that daily tending is. Mm. Well, EJ, as we call her, as I call her, I call her, I have a, a different name for her, super, but everyone calls her EJ. My name for her is, is my name for her. No one else calls her that. Um, she was my breakaway um, principal. I was, again, like I said, born in a world of truth value statements that were exclusive and repulsive to any kind of modification. Um, It's either this or that. There is no, it's an Aristotelian dualism. There is no middle. Um, uh, And she came like this beautiful force even though she's more christian and she 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 she's christian and she she has a different notion of the faith but she definitely abides by those values which i don't um um but she came as a as my emancipation from the strictures the rigid world that i live in because she seemed to embody this multiple intersectional thing. You know, she's not actually fully Indian by way of speaking. Um, She's Indian, she's English, and she's Nigerian, and she's Iranian. (laughs) She's she's, um, a mother and father and a grandmother. It's just like immigrant communities coming through India you know, they, um, so the, the Iranian, English, um, Indian mother gave birth to, you know, my mother-in-law. And, and so she's a mix of multiple things. And I think it shows in how she just broke me free from that. Um, every day we, we, these times have been difficult for us, this pandemic times. Our structure of support, you know, is totally out. And so we have to be with the kids, our two kids, all the time. And it's very exhausting. And no airs about this, no poetic escape from, from sharing that with you. It's very, very difficult. And it can get very shitty sometimes. <laughs> it can get very grimy and we don't know, ex- know exactly what to do. But there's a, there's a prophetic core. And by prophecy, I mean a thickness, not a prediction of a future, but a thickness in the now that binds me and EJ and our family together. Um, 
it's not even a sense of hope that we will thrive. It's just a sense that the universe brought you to me, you know, and I to you. And we're not leaving for anything, you know. Some days we will tend to our relationship by sitting with each, with each other. And some days we'll just be exhausted and say, I just want to go to bed, you know. But in spite of that, there's this, this, this thickness that holds us true um, to ourselves. That is our most conservative and yet emergent place of being with each other. Um, and we, we guard that place. It's, 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 it's sacred to us. Um, I can share this, um, that um, she was a lecturer in the university where I became a lecturer in, and I finished from, graduated from, and invited back to teach as a professor. And we met, and when we fell in love with each other, she would, uh, uh, one day I, because I, I'm a nerd, totally a nerd, and, and, and one day I, I decided to share with her my dreams for kids, that if we're gonna get married, and have kids, um, then these are the names because it's a blueprint that a socially starved nerd like myself um, has and has, I've always had this because I didn't get to go out much. And if you don't actually get socializing much, you tend to socialize in script and in master plans of taking over the universe. So I said, these are in the scheme of things, these are the names of, um, the children that I hope you would like as well. And she was shocked by the names that I'd given, especially the first one. Um, when I said the name, it was Alethea. And I said, I would like the first one to be Alethea. And she said, you're kidding. And I said, no, Alethea, yes. It, I know it's strange because no one calls, I've, I've never encountered the name anywhere before. Um, not in Nigeria, at least. And I was fully based in Nigeria at the time. And she said, that's exactly the name that I want to uh, give my first daughter as well, Alethea. And it was, it was no way. And she had written it down, Alethea. Um, the second one was different. You know, I named the second one Kelita. And she named the second one Sela or something like that. It was an R sound. <laughs> you know, I forget what she named but we didn't go by that since we felt maybe the second one wants to be something different. There's something happening here. We wanted two girls, both of us, um, but it turned out to be a girl and a boy. So there you go. Something different wanted to happen. But the first was sure. We said the name, Alethea. And so that we, it only reinforces this notion that children are not just passive recipients of instruction. And maybe Alethea called for us to be her parents and insisted on being named that name. So I, I'm just speaking to the, the mysterious heart of our relationship um, that stretches and yawns and is sometimes tired and is sometimes vibrant, like relationships are, but is always in love. Yeah, it's so beautiful. I have never heard of that description of that thickness. And it really, <laughs> I can feel it, like that thickness it does feel like the the waters of devotion. There is this, yeah, 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 that where it contains all the textures. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. I've never shared that on an interview or podcast before, so you're the first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to go into your writing a little bit and. Uh, really more your writing process, um, because just the way you write, you pull on so much like science, mythos, religion. Um, it's obviously very intelligent writing and thorough, and you have this capacity of pulling in so much. I'm just curious how you let your mind wander when you write and what your process is to then come together with this conglomerate of of meaning? I've taught myself to half expect that question every time. <laughs> and I, permit me if I meant I, I, uh, a respond this way, but I, 
I really do not know how to not wonder. Like it's, it's always been my experience. Like I've always been wondering um, since, yeah, since I was a kid, I was, like I said, I'm very flighty, right? right? I'm very atmospheric. And so I like to fly. I really love to fly. My, my mother told me where I was born in a diplo- into a diplomatic family. So we lived in Germany and across the world for some time. That may have something to do with it. I don't know. But, but I remember she told me that while in Berlin, no, in Bonn was where we lived, not Berlin. Um, I would say, I want to go to the moon. And it was, my, it was my catchphrase. Everyone knew me. I was just three years old. And everyone knew me with, Bio wants to go to the moon. So I've always wanted to fly, to just wander like a wandering planet. And I feel mostly at home when I'm not at home. <laughs> you know, uh, with, it's a different meaning now that I'm at home. Um, but I feel, I feel when my mind strays from fixed algorithms, I feel like, I feel warm, I feel embraced, I feel noticed, or I feel held. Um, so I don't know how to, I've never really got my act together in processing a way to respond to the question of process, uh, of writing. I just know that, I, that it comes, that it's, it feels like a gift. It feels like I'm possessed. Um, but it's also a lot of learning, some hard-won victories. Um, and it's also a lot of failure. Um, I'm usually told that I need to be clearer in my writing. Um, that clarity is a thing that is needed. Some of my closest friends say, I don't understand that sentence. Um, and I've struggled with that for some time. And maybe this is the deepest I will go in, it, in speaking about process, is to be vulnerable with how writing and I show up with each other. You know, that I'm, um, I, I usually, you know, the idea of you need to be clearer, you know, so that people understand you. Uh, the way that I'm taking that in now is recognizing that there's a place, that there is a time when you need to, be, when you need to be clear, but that my gifts, my most dominant gifts lie in madness, <laughs> um, lie in speaking a miss, not straightforwardly, but speaking from the corners of my mouth, that there is some poetic trickstery value um, in Confucian. And it's not the Confucian of just trying to check up a word, but in a Confucian of um, the kind of Confucian that liberates you from the... Um, the stabilizing effect of meaning, right? Bewilderment is a word that I like a lot. And I like the way God in the Bible, in the Christian text, responds to Job, who demands answers and clarity in a moment of suffering. And God, like a drunk psychologist, responds in that, have you seen Pleiades? Have you seen uh, Leviathan? Have you, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Instead of responding to the poor man's questions, he starts to dance all over the place about creation. And I feel in that moment, many people might say, you know, God isn't responding. He's not helping this fellow. But, but I feel that maybe God was drawing him out of his economy of meaning and sense making so that he could enter another space, a feud of different kinds of possibilities other than the one he's logically tied to. That is the function of my writing. And again, I do not know how it comes to be that way. Um, I can only recognize the gift with humility. And do you, do you find you need a certain space for that? Like, are you at night? I mean, we're doing this interview. It's 1030. Okay. We started this interview at 1030 yeah. at night. So I had a moment okay. of like, he a nocturnal? <laughs> Let's, let's do that then. Yes, let's do that. I, I do prefer nights. Nights are very enchanting for me. Um, uh, I don't like the coldness, the clinical sterility of daytime. <laughs> it's too there. It's too white. It's too bright. 
darkness is hidden and mysterious. It's like when I can't see, then I can see many things. <laughs> like right, there are fairies in the dark, and who's to say there aren't, right? And then writing becomes possible, madness becomes possible, prophecy becomes possible. So I write, I do, I do love writing at night. Um, I love writing with music. Hey, I'm doing this process thing after all. There you go. You're, you're playing psychologist with me, sister. Um, I, I love writing with music. Mm. And sometimes I need to listen to music to know what to write. Um, the music kind of unfurls the tense places. And then I, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, and it never comes, like music is never straightforward. It, it pulls in many directions. It's harmonious and it's cacophonous as, as well. So um, that sense of chaos inhabits my writing as well. So I want to read mythos into archetypes, into Baldor and Norse mythology, into Yoruba mythology, into science, and never arrive in the same place. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for going. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I did. I did. I went. <laughs> I went there. <laughs> My last question, really, we could just do one last question is, yes, what is burning in you right now? Well, what are you, I mean, I you know you shared about, you know, being in the family environment and kind of the pressure cooker of that experiment. And yeah. um, is there anything that you feel in particular that you're kind of in the depths of or that's arising? Maybe there's something you're just exploring in your own psyche or process. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I've been speaking about making sanctuary for a while. And I, there isn't time to get into the world building, the missiles, the cosmology of making sanctuary, you know, except to say that I see it as this end time research inquiry um, that might help us a strategy for meeting the world differently, a strategy for meeting ourselves differently, a strategy for noticing quite critically how justice can often stand in the way of transformation. Um, and a fugitive practice as well. So, fugitivity is burning you know is it's is alive in me now it's and by fugitivity i mean this um this this set of this processual stream that is almost godlike right in the way that i described god as a flowing away from the expected you know the fugitive flows away from the plantation of the familiar and I feel that we're in such a very, very flagrant um, um, powerful time, electrifying time, that we need new kinds of thinking. And in order to be here, in order to work the ancestors, to work the non-human, to rework ourselves, we need a sense of sanctuary. By sanctuary, I don't mean a place of safety, a refuge. I mean a place where we can fall apart um, and actually embark an exile together. Um, there, is a, there is a term, uh, I think it means going into the underworld, catabasis. You know, it, it means retreat, going under. Um, Almost, you can think of it in a Jungian fashion as some alchemical process of falling down into the darkness, into the shadow. It's not the same as shadow work, but um, writ large, it's this invitation to dark places. That in times of crisis, there is a falling down to earth that needs to happen. Um, because it's only there that we can know how to relate you know, with the next or how to offer libations to the monsters that are already teeming, already alive around us. Um, so that, my sister, is burning for me. Um, my son and my daughter are always alive as well for me. How to, 
how to self-correct, how to process my failures, how to offer myself um, vulnerably before them, how to treat them as altars, you know, places of worship. That's more than anything else. You know, if everything else were to die, this I hope would would still be powerfully alive for me. You know, they both call on me in ways that are difficult for me to hear. In spite of my writing and invitations out there, they keep on calling on to me and inviting me to meet myself differently, to touch my own demons. Um, and I think that's cosmic in itself. You know, meeting them is, is the creation of new universes. Mm. It's not just an aspect of a universe. It is world-building work. And it's modest, but it's also simultaneously huge. So, yeah, that's it. Mm. <laughs> Making sanctuary with my children. Well, thank you so much, Bio. It's been such an honor to have the breadth of your presence and expression here today. So, and your heart, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.